Welcome everyone. Today, we're going to have the third in our series of uh, chef demonstrations, uh, specifically focused on indigenous women chefs. Uh, I'm Mindy Kurzer. I'm director of the Healthy Food, Healthy Lives Institute at the University of Minnesota. And with the Shakopee, Midwakot and Sioux community, we co-host the annual conference on Native American nutrition. Since the fifth con conference was postponed because of the pandemic, we decided this year to host a series of webinars until we're able to have the next conference in person, which hopefully is gonna be in the spring of 2022. So we have today uh, two wonderful chefs. We will be posting in the chat the link for you to register for future webinars as well. But today we have Kim Tilson Braveheart, and I'd like to introduce her. Kim is an enrolled citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. She's a small businesswoman entrepreneur executive chef and co-owner of Etiquette Catering Company, a unique artisan catering company located in the heart of downtown Rapid City. Kimberly is a sixth generation entrepreneur, proud to be part of the Tonka Bar family. Kim has been featured in Condé Nast Traveler, Departures Magazine, Fodors, and numerous other publications. Along with her husband, Brandon Braveheart, she launched an Etiquette Indigenous Catering Company in 2018, in which they use their indigenous food knowledge and leverage food sovereignty to highlight cuisine of the region. Kim has been awarded numerous, numerous awards, including the prestigious national award from the National Center 40 Under 40 that recognizes 40 emerging Native American leaders who have demonstrated leadership, initiative, and dedication and made significant contributions in business. Kim is going to be doing the demonstration today. Our commentator today will be Tanya Brandt. Chef Tanya Brandt is a Mohawk Nation chef helping to revitalize the foods of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. She has been working in the food industry for 26 years, over 26 years. Tanya works closely with her mother at Mohawk Sand Seed Keepers Garden and was brought up with traditional foods. And she's always brought her passion to those dishes through culture. It took 20 years to marry these concepts, being a chef, using traditional foods. And when she did, she started Yowego Foods in 2014, a catering company serving traditional foods to the community. It is the first of its kind daily Haudenosaunee food offered on her home territory of Six Nations of the Grand River in Southern Ontario. So I welcome Chef Kim and Chef Tanya for our wonderful third installment of Indigenous Women Chefs, de Chef Demonstration. So I'll turn it over now to Kim Tilson Braveheart to start telling us what you're gonna do. Hi everybody, it's so great to be with all of you today. Um, listening to my bio is awesome, but it's so embarrassing. Hashtag humble, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing my slow roasted um, buffalo and I normally cook it in a render duck fat, but I'm gonna give you a little different tip for the average um, chef. And we're gonna also be doing a Hasselback squash with a maple syrup and apple vinegar um, glaze that's absolutely delicious. It's also stunningly beautiful. Um, and that's what we're going to start with. And then we'll do a, blo a blackberry bojapi to finish. Like something that I just kind of top out over the dish um, for flavor. Uh, so it's great to be with all of you today. And yeah, I'm going to get started. So I've, I've already cut the, um, the butternut squash in half. And I've also cleaned out the seeds. Um, where you have the other part cooking so you can see what the end looks like. And what I do is because I'm going to cut it in the Hasselback way, um, I trim it so it's pretty straight on, if that makes sense. I make sure that the line is um, straight. And what I'm using is you can use anything. You can use chopsticks even. 
but I use these like little wooden sticks um, for my line, but I'm going to peel it. Um, a lot of times people think like, ah, just toss it in the oven um, without peeling it. And the only reason why I peel it is because it cooks faster <laughs> and it doesn't take quite as long. Um, but also because of the way that I'm going to cut the squash, um, it gets through that heavy line. And so I don't cut off a, a finger or something. So that's also super helpful. Um, yeah, Tanya, what are some of your favorite squash squashes up there? <laughs> Hey, stay go, stay go, go, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, squash. So I'm just gonna mention too, just for anybody that has back means it just means those nice fine little cuts throughout yeah. the thing. So when you you know roast it or whatever, it just makes it really pretty. Um, like Kim said, it does make something really amazing. So I'm happy to see so, squash. Um, I'm happy to see this. <laughs> um, I'd say, um, uh, yeah, we have quite a few squashes up here. Uh, one of my favorite to work with though is uh, blue hubbard squashes. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I just seem to really like them, and um, I just think it's funny in Mohawk. I don't, I can't think of the word right now, but it, it means ugly squash for ours. But I'm like, it makes such beautiful soups though. <laughs> they do. There, it's one of my favorite flavors, the hubbard squash. I think it. They, and I also think that they look like ancient you know, like ancient dinosaurs or something too, the Hubbard. Did I lose you? Yeah, the kids like really like looking at them. No, no, I just turned my video off because it's being oh, okay. kind of funny. Like, yeah, it was being a little choppy for me. So I was hoping this will help it a little. I'm not gonna peel the whole thing yeah. because of time, but I just wanna show you how to do it. And um, the glaze is super, super easy. Um, it's just, it's, it's literally a quarter cup of apple vinegar and a quarter cup of maple syrup. You don't need a ton. Um, and this maple syrup is from White Earth, the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota, but it's, um, and you can use any maple syrup you want that's you know local to your area. I'm actually, I grew up, I was born in Pine Ridge. I was born on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, but I um, grew up in Minnesota. So I have lots of friends and relatives over in that area. So now I'm just, like I said, I'm gonna just show you how to do it, um, not the whole thing, just because of time. And so what I'm doing is I'm just aligning the sticks together against the squash so there's a straight line. And so what you're doing is what's the, I mean, the whole point of it is that you don't cut all the way through. This is, everyone teases me about my little tiny chef knife, but I have super small hands, so that's why I use it. But what you wanna do is, you know, squashes are pretty tough. So you just kinda of wanna push down and then you're gonna hit those sticks so you don't go all the way. And then you're just gonna do it again. And I just- yeah. It just gives you that extra security so you don't go all the way through and hopefully don't break it because you really want it like it does come out as a stunning dish so you, yes. you don't want to break it <laughs> yeah and so i um am just going down and it's protecting those sticks are protecting um again just from going all the way down i find that if you just like go up and down Put a little pressure then it's like it hits perfectly you can practice your spiralizing it so you can hang to dry them <laughs> and it's really beautiful like already you can see it just opens up it's really really pretty and so what i did again was i just put a quarter cup of maple syrup and a quarter cup of apple vinegar and i brought it to boil i let it boil for about three minutes it kind of sizzles over um, and it turns into sort of like this really beautiful glaze. And so then what I do is with a brush, ah, sorry. with a brush, I just go like this, brush it all over generously. And I kind of go in between, in, in between the squash like that. And you want to get the flavor in there too. So um, this is just like a, 
it's used for pastry, but it's really great. I use it, I use this brush all the time because I use it for my duck fat too. And so I just kind of brush it all the way in like so. And then I have these beautiful bay leaves brush. They're not the dried, but you can use dried if you want. Um, and then I just kind of slide it in like so every couple one. And so that, and Arla, do you wanna grab this one? So that is what it will look like when you put it in and you go all the way the whole entire length of the squash. And um, I drizzle a little bit of salt um, before I put it in. I think for the last time. Does not need to be a lot. If you're not doing salt, that's fine. You don't need to do it. Um, but then I put it into the oven, um, preheated oven at 425 degrees for about 45 minutes and I check it because of the, um, you can just sit here. Um, because of the apple um, vinegar and the maple syrup, you wanna make sure that you're either cooking it in a tin foil or you're putting um, a sheet underneath it so that it doesn't burn up and <laughs> it doesn't make your entire house smoky or anything like that. Um, so that's what it looks like when you put it in and you'll do the whole length of the squash. You cook it like this, um, not like this. And again, 45 minutes. And then when it comes out, it is this like gorgeous, delicious squash that looks like this. Ah. Um, and it's also really that is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and it's, it smells amazing and it tastes amazing. And it's like, you know, a different way of eating squash. And so it's one of the things, but I also love the way that it looks like when, when we finish plating this dish, you'll see that. Um, and it's so pretty. Um, I've made them for events before and where they're just like on a platter with six of these and you're like, what is it? It's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I, it's the flavor, the, the um, apple vinegar and the maple syrup is just like a very light flavor. So you can still taste the squash and it doesn't feel like it's this overpowering of like sweetness. Um, That's that vinegar help so the, come through it. So it's more of adjusting it to just sweet, right? I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, I was going to say just mentioned that the vinegar right cuts through it so it's more like a dressing so it's not just the sweet like with the maple so it hits your palate yes. a little different so exactly and it has that really com the really good combination of the acid with the vinegar and the sweetness but then also the savoriness of the actual flavor of the squash which I love and I also think it's really important like when you're cooking with any kind of indigenous foods that like you actually can taste them <laughs> and what their and the, what their original flavor is so that's one of the reasons why I love this because it's really simple, but you can still have that really nice buttery flavor of the squash, of the traditional squash. Um, and the, the leaves are the bay leaves. Um, and I use them for flavoring when you're cooking, but then when you're done, and I like to show the display, but before I actually serve, um, I put, I just take them out, just like that. <laughs> I just take them out and then I plate it however I'm gonna plate it. Um, and again, for the, for the glaze, it's one quarter cup of um, apple cider vinegar, one quarter cup of maple syrup, the best quality that you can get um, and local. And then I just put, bring it to boil and you gotta watch it so it doesn't burn or over, overcast. Um, and then I, cook, I boil it for about five minutes and it turns into this really nice like syrup glaze. Um, and then I, again, I just brush it over the squash. Um, does anyone have any other questions about this specific thing? Um, we had a question from the audience that was about the temperature setting. Oh, um, sure. So I bake it at 425 degrees. Um, and you could probably bump it up if you want to 450. But I like to, uh, because of... I don't want it to get mushy um, in the way that you're cutting it. Like there's a lot of avail availability for it to lose its texture. And I want it to stay 
the whole point, <laughs> the whole point of doing it this way is so that it's so beautiful, right? Um, so you want to make sure that that's why I do it at 425 and I do it for about 45 minutes. I check it um, and I make sure that it's pork tender, but if it's a little under par, if that makes sense. Yeah. What about, um, they were also wondering how thin to slice it, you think? And also, did that foil cover it? Or was it just sitting on it when it was in the oven? It was just sitting on it. I don't cover it um, because the whole point of the glaze is to give that like really beautiful shiny sheen and you want the oven to be able to do that. And if it's covered, it won't. Um, but I, I don't know. They're not exactly perfect. So don't, don't judge me, chef. Um, <laughs> but I would, I would say about, you know, I don't know, like a thumbnail. <laughs> I don't know. It's not very scientific. Um, I like I said, what I'm doing is when I'm cutting it, I just try to do like I go one line and I just lift up and then I just move a little bit over and I do another. Um, and just really watch those guides. And like I said, you can use anything. You can use chopsticks. Um, sage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our last um, oh, and if you don't want to use bay leaves, you can totally use something that is local to you in your environment. Like we could even use like a, a white a white sage here um, and give it that herby flavor as well. So whatever is traditional to your community, you're welcome to use as well. I just okay, I like the way it looks. <laughs> it makes it look beautiful and really and really special. Um, so that's why I use the bay leaves. But you can use anything that's in from your area. Any other questions? Oh, how long does a squash last? Um, so I actually have squash from this past fall. And like I said, if you keep it in a cool, dry place, you should be able to withstand at least the winter months um, without it getting moldy. But remember, don't store it with potatoes or onions. Um, they're, not, they're not homies in the cellar, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you definitely want to check them too while they're in there because um, you'll see if they start to go, then you definitely want to prepare them right away. Um, the other thing is, is you can rotate them as well. Like just give them a turn and that so they're not particularly like sitting on one one area and even um, like hanging them. And that goes for like melons and things like that too, um, just to help prolong their, their, their storage. Great advice, Chef. Yeah, <laughs> I actually didn't turn, not this year, but last year, I kind of like forgot about them. And then I went in and like half of them were all like moldy and soggy and I was so bummed, but <laughs> lesson learned. Um, and so then what I'm gonna do with this squash is I'm going to cut a couple of pieces on the end and it's, it's soft enough to do. And so what you see is like this really, they, they're still together. They're still together and they are like, you know, they're this beautiful shape. And then I'm gonna put it them on a plate so that you can see them for the finished pot product. Oh, that looks so yummy though. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm excited. I want to try this now. Yeah, it's, it's so pretty too. And, you know, and I love squash, but I feel like a lot of people don't know different ways to prepare it. They all used to like I don't know, for me anyways, I don't know if it's growing up in Minnesota, but I feel like everybody just put tons of like butter and brown sugar. So um, this is a way to do it that doesn't feel like, I can't even taste the squash. <laughs> yeah, it's it's still a vegetable at that point, right? It's not uh, just a piece of candy, candy dough. <laughs> exactly. Don't exactly. get me wrong, it tastes great, but it's not the healthiest thing in the world, right? So this is definitely yeah, a totally. lot lighter option. And I can see why you'd love it for catering too, with uh, uh, for people that don't know, Kim and I both do quite a bit of catering. Um, so I, I love this idea in that sense, like if you, you got to feed a crowd or whatever, right? Like that's it's so pretty. <laughs> I know it's pretty and people are like really impressed by it all the time. Um, but remember, like don't give people uh, the bay leaves too, because the bay leaves can leave like a tingling feeling on some people's tongue that's not so great. Arlo, I'm going to hand you this if this is okay. Arlo is not only my producer today, he's also my sous. Thanks, Arlo. <laughs> now we just got to get him to do those dishes. <laughs> yeah, he, he won't, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. There's his to... limits. <laughs> okay, I'm just moving on to the buffalo. Any other questions about the squash before moving on?
Oh, there's one about the squash. Does it, does it have to be served hot or warm? <laughs> I mean, I would serve it warm, um, but you know, like I don't think so because I even put this um, with like when I have leftovers, I just make a little salad with a little um, maple vinaigrette yeah. and then I put the squash on top and it's not warm and it's still really good, but you just want to make sure that it's cooked all the way through. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're doing catering, especially like we sub cook things, which means like kind of undercook them a little because they're going to be sitting in um, chafing dishes for so long, and then they're going to finish cooking off in those chafing dishes before serving. So that's one of the other things. It's just like, if you're going to make it, you can eat it cold. Um, and it's really good. Like it has a really unique and nice flavor. Uh, and so in a salad, it'd be great too. Okay. So now we're going to yeah. move on to Buffalo. Any other questions? Um, this one, this is a question for both chefs. Main uses questions. So for basting butters, oils, and sauces, pre-cooking, two sauces, what? For sauce, condiments, decorating plates. Um, hang on, I'll, I'll figure out this question, then you can you can describe your dish. I'm getting I'm a little confused by it. <laughs> Are they giving us a tip? Um, okay, so this buffalo is a buffalo that we actually field harvested with Arlo and Lisa Ironcloud. And um, it was actually a really huge roast that we cut up um, to make smaller. Um, but one of the things that that's important about learning about how to cook with buffalo is that a lot of people get intimidated by it because it doesn't have a ton of fat. And so when you get the buffalo, this actually has more fat. It has a fat cap on, on both sides, um, which is actually not normal. But what I like to do is I dry, I just use the paper towel and I dry the buffalo um, and then what I do on both sides is I use the salt. I use salt pretty heavily um, on both sides. And then I use um, garlic powder, you know, not super fancy, but I, I'm generous with it. I'm really generous with the garlic. And no, I don't have an exact amount. Sorry, it's just like what feels right, I don't know. For me, as much garlic as I can. And then I use paprika and both of these all together are actually a natural preservative, which means that it keeps your meat really moist and not dry. And so then I put that on and I put the other side on. And why I keep saying dry, and then what I do is I rub, kind of rub it in there like you're you know, giving somebody a nice back massage I, I rub all the spices together. And anytime when you're working with meat too, is like you want, um, you want it, if you really want that flavor in there, you want to really work it, even if it's hamburger, um, because you're helping break up that muscle a little. And so I just make sure, like, I feel like I missed a whole spot. So I'm going to just put a little more in that area. And then I'm just going to do the same thing. You rub it in really, really well. Did we lose Tanya again? Oh, she's there. People want to know what cut this is. Oh, this is just a chuck, chuck, a buffalo chuck roast. This is not beef. Um, so this is buffalo. Can you substitute the meat? With beef? Sure. I mean, I wouldn't cook it. With buffalo, you want to do what I say is like slow and easy meaning you want to cook it at for a long period of time at a really slow temperature so that you do not overcook the meat and it turns dry and hard. You want to be really gentle with it and you want to be good to it. Nice and patient. With beef, you have a little more leeway. You don't have to cook it as long. Um, you could even turn up your temperature a little bit if you want to because of the fat content in it. The other thing that you should know, depending on the size of your roast, is that you will have some shrinkage um, because of how the buff, these are, this is a wild animal. And so they eat tons and tons of grass, which means that then that results into moisture inside of the meat. And so this will probably lose, um, your shrinkage will probably be about 25%, which I know that sounds like a lot, but it really is. So with Buffalo, you have to remember that, that you, you may be buying a roast, you know, a seven pound, eight pound roast, but you're really going to get about a five five pound roast out of it. It can be pretty, the, the shrinkage can be pretty intense. 
So what I do after it's all flavored and massaged well, um, I then grill it um, on a flat, on a hot flame on, on the barbecue. I, I did this one already because I don't have a grill here. Um, but what I did was like, you'll see the cap on it. It's this nice crust on both sides, six minutes each. And on my grill, I do it about 450, about 450 degrees for six minutes, set a timer, flip it over um, and do the same thing. Six minutes, pretty easy. Then what I do is I put it in, I'm gonna take these gloves off. Um, I put it in a crock pot like this, this lovely crock pot here, and I cook it. Um, I first turn it up as high as you can for an hour. And you really wanna make sure that it is only an hour because otherwise, again, you will dry out your meat. Um, and so what I, put, I do is I put the whole roast in, and then um, I'm gonna do a little trick. I normally use um, render duck fat that I put on top, which is a great substitute for butter. But with this, I'm just gonna use a whole stick of butter because guess what? All of y'all can get butter. Um, and then I just put it in there and I slow cook it between 10 to 12 hours. And then this is the magic. So then you get this like, ah, hold on. So then you get this like magical, full, beautiful roast. Can you see that? So pretty. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I put on, I also throw in like a little sprig of beautiful flowered rosemary, which just gives it this really earthy herb flavor too. And once, this is like how amazing this is. So look how, okay, so just for sake, pre-cook, slow cook. Look at the shrinkage. This is something that's important so that when you're prepping your meal, you're like, what happened to half my meat? <laughs> um, and then what you want to do is like, this is like melt in your mouth. Amazing. And you, it just, it literally will just fall apart. So good. And it's, I wish you were here to smell it because it smells so good. Um, I'm going to give Arlo a bite so that he can tell you how amazing it is. Oh my God. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's really good. It's so, so good. Um, and like I said, it just literally, I mean, you don't even have to do anything. It just comes apart and it's amazing. And how simple was that? It's like not very hard. And it's such a good way for people who are intimidated by buffalo to eat buffalo because it's this like very, it feels decadent, but it also just feels like spirit eating food. It's so good. And I love it so much. Um, and then with the squash, phenomenal, like absolutely phenomenal. And then you just serve it. And what I do is I split it up um, with a fork and I just keep breaking it apart like this. Um, I, you know, I don't slice it because you wanna cook it so it continues to be that like tender, that tenderness. And I think that if you were to slice it, it would just kind of fall apart and dry out. So that's why I, I split it up. Any liquid in the slow cooker with the meat? None, none. I don't cook it with any liquid in it other than either the duck fat or the or the butter. Um, and like no moisture, I don't add water. Um, like I said, especially with buffalo, because of their diet, there's tons of moisture already in the meat. Oh, I never thought to do that. <laughs> I, well, because I've been baking a lot of bison in the shop, but bison's not something I, um, traditionally really work with because there's no bison in my area or at least not anymore like it's been a very long time so um, in terms of game meat around here they don't even really think you like bison ain't on the list right <laughs> but um, you know now that I have a restaurant it's hard to get wild game right so there is a bison farm that's local that I get from so I've been working with it a lot more and um, and really it's the first time in my career that I um, and have been doing that, but I never thought like, yeah, when I braise the meats and stuff, I've been putting liquid in there, but yeah, you're right. Like there is quite, I like the jus because I'm like, ooh, lots of gravy, but. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna show you, you like, this, but. 
So this is a good example. Like I didn't add any moisture to it or anything. And like, look how much moisture is in there. There's quite a bit. And you could easily make yeah. that into a gravy or an au jus as well, um, which is phenomenal and delicious. Like, but that is its natural juices. And there's nothing better than that. You don't need to add water. You don't need to add, add oil. It is its natural juices and it's phenomenal. So if you want to make it into a gravy, you can, but even just put drizzle a little bit on top. So, so delicious. Can you substitute with venison? Sure, I would do the same thing. Venison, and again, except for when you're when you're doing the um, rubbing, you really want to like work it a little bit. You want to work into that muscle. Anytime you're using any kind of wild game, you want to really take care of it because again, it's that wild animal. It's out there running in the, <laughs> in the woods or whatever out here in the plains, uh, but you want to take care of it. And so you want to kind of break up that muscle a little bit so you get that tenderness and that deliciousness. There's another question. Yeah, I think you would definitely, for, for any moose meat, moose meat, elk meat, anything, you'd probably be able to give the same treatment. Venison's a little drier. I'd probably put some liquid in there. Um, but yeah, even like beaver and stuff, this is a good method for any kind of game meat, especially for anybody that's beginners to get, you know, get that gamey flavor out. And um, Admittedly, yeah, I really I like your recipe. Beaver before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is bison... Why is bison? Why is, oh, beef? sorry. Oh, okay. So this is a really good question. Um, so buffalo or bison, the American bison, is the traditional diet of our region, of the Lakota people. And that's what I am. I'm Lakota. And this is our people were nomadic and um, buffalo roamed everywhere. And it was this... Um, there, it's super, super healthy. It's a super lean meat. It digests in your, in your system quicker than any other meat, even I think comparable to salmon. So it's really good for your digestive system. Um, it's great for your overall health. And I also believe, and I don't know if this is true, but for women, I think it's really important to have some of that wild game for like that blood making um, strength. Any other questions? Somebody asked about the on the grill, is it indirect or is it direct? It's direct. Um, when you're putting the meat on, it's on the direct flame and it's gonna pop up a little, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna pop up a little, just close your, just close your, um, your barbecue for about six minutes, six minutes on each side. So 12 minutes total, put it in. If you have access to duck, duck fat, I would use it because it just gives it another like elevated flavor. But if not, you can use butter as well. And you kind of think about it like this, like, if this meat is so, so um, lean, what are ways that I can reintroduce fat that is like in a healthy way? Um, because even if you think about like a stick of butter for a nine pound roast is pretty good. Like it's not, you're not introducing too much fat. It's not like a beef roast where it would take you, you know, five days to digest. Do you turn the meat at all when it's roasting under 10 hours? No, I do not turn the meat at all. Um, I don't, I leave it, I, I don't touch it. I don't look at it. I kind of feel like it's like rice, you know, I feel like it's bad luck. If I check it out, I don't know why that is. I've, uh, I've created that in my head, but that's what I do is I just like kind of leave it alone and trust the process. And that's one of the things that I've like learned, especially when cooking any form of meat is trust the process is, you know, a lot of people are like, where is going to be underdone or I'm going to worry it's going to be overdone. Just trust the process. Um, and it will work out great. And you're gonna seem like a phenomenal cook with a super simple recipe. I mean, this buffalo is probably my most requested um, thing that I cook anywhere. And um, lots of chefs are like, that meat is the most amazing thing I've ever done. Because again, because of the lack of fat in buffalo, people have a tendency to overcook it and they cook it on high heat. And so it creates that like dryness and that like toughness when you're trying to cook the meat. Can I bake the squash in a cast iron pan? Oh, sure. Yeah, that would be beautiful. It would probably give it a nice little crust, too. I love cast iron. So it would give it a nice little crust on the squash. I think that would be great. Have you tried hassle backing a whole cylinder squash? Oh, I mean, I could probably do it with like Tanya because she got some more muscle than I do. But, you know, you could, you, you could. Um, I have hassle backed a pumpkin before and that was nuts, uh, but it was pretty and I did it for a party. 
Any other questions? Yeah, not really that I see. Are you there? Yeah, well, the one earlier was just, um, they wanted to know what kind of pastry brushes we like using. Me, usually, I'm just so thankful to have one. I don't really care what it is, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I would say the nylon ones are just, um, they don't do as good a job as bristle brushes, but bristle brushes always come out. So there's pros and cons. Yeah, the other thing too is I like the, I use a silicone one. I don't know if you saw it, but it's like a double, a double um, I'll grab it just a second. So it's like this double, I use this for everything. I even use it if I'm like putting barbecue sauce on. It's a double bristle brush. So it has um, like, a, it's a silicone brush. It's not very expensive, um, but it's great to have. And I use it all the time. It's like one of my favorite tools in the kitchen. And um, I used to use nylon brushes, but I find that they, um, some of their hairs can come out and I just don't want it in the food. You know, as a native people, we're like highly judged if there's anything like that. And if we're like, oh my God. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like super cautious about it. Um, so I just use this and it's like not, like I think I spent like five bucks on it. Mm, yeah, not, not super expensive or anything. The setting on the slow cooker, is that low or high? So again, um, what you're going to do on the, on the slow cooker, if you, like mine has a low, a, a low or a high temp. And what I do for the first hour is I cook it high for 40, for an hour. And I really make sure that I'm not cooking it further at high for an hour. Otherwise you're going to just dry out your meat. And then I drop it down to low for between eight and 10 hours. And I just leave it. And in your house is going to smell phenomenal. And it's going to just sound like, smell like love and medicine. It's going to be so good. If you're serving this for dinner, what time do you start the meat? So, what, okay, this is another thing that I do is um, I often cook the meat the night before. And then I bring it all the way to cool after it's done. And then I start to reheat the meat in the, within the, la the first, uh, excuse me, the last hour before serving. Um, because, so then it still has all that yummy juices and moisture, um, and then it's back to a nice hot temperature. People want to know your crock pot. Oh, wow. Um, it's in California. <laughs> it's not very fancy or anything. You can get it at Target for like 50 bucks, I don't know. But it's my favorite one. I use it. I have humongous roasters because I'm a caterer, but like this is the one that I like. I'm used to it. It serves my family. It's great. No other questions? Okay. So now we're going to move on to our last one, which is the wojapi. And it's, um, it's super easy. Anyone can make it. And one of the things that I love about wojapi or berry pudding is that most tribes throughout the entire country have some form of this thing um, of like our, when, in Lakota, <clears throat> we call it wojapi, but it can be, I don't know. Um, Tanya, are you there? What do you call yours? Um, I don't know. I've never really seen our people make anything like that, which is pretty crazy because we use so much I have to get with some berries. <laughs> but yeah, we just we do so much with berries and, and those ceremonies are really important. But um, <laughs> like we all eat jam and things like that on our scone and, you know, we don't do fried bread. But <laughs> um, I was trying to think of that when you were saying that. And I'm like, I know because we just eat our berries fresh or we dry <laughs> them, um, even kind of make like our fruit leather. But I've never really seen anybody do too much in terms of making like a wajapi with it. So it's kind of, you don't really see that in my area. So I guess that's something that's pretty different with our, with our, our cultures. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh my God, I'm like choking a little bit. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh my gosh. I think when I was up in Six, Six Nations, I'm still gonna have to get some water, I'm sorry. <laughs> I never knew you came up to Six Nations. Oh, that's awesome. That's play you into my bed. <laughs> um, there was somebody who was asking about doing the bison on the grill. Um, like, I mean, you can, 
treat it like any other piece of protein where you're going to be cooking it. If you want to do that slow and low, you're going to kind of do it without um, that indirect heat. Well, you want to do indirect heat, right? So put it on the side and um, just let it go. And it'll be like the same thing. Like for me, if we're doing it, it's just going to do it overnight. Um, and just like how Kim does, that's how I do for my restaurant where I just kind of set it and forget it. So when we come back the next day, um, you know, you come in just the, the, the whole place smells awesome. So, you know, those first people coming and they're just like, oh my God, what are you cooking? So it's really good for that in the morning. You have the smell wafting outside and people kind of coming by and can get you some of those sales. <laughs> uh, well, there was somebody just asking about whether you could put that on the grill, like to cook it. And I'm like, well, I guess any protein, right? Indirect heat, if you want to do it for, for quite a few hours. It would be a lot of work. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> if you feel like babysitting your barbecue and, you know, I guess if you're you sitting there all day, really have, to have a beer, watch it. spray yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and you would have to, you know, you would have to just keep checking it because I think that if you were to do it on a grill, it's so hard to monitor that. You would probably yeah, want to think of smoker. Yeah. Yeah. You could yeah. do it on a smoker. So it maintains that moisture. I mean, that's the only thing I worry about with buffalo is the mm -hmm. moisture is, you know, you just don't want it to dry out because if you dry out, no one's going to eat it. Um, and I think that's why most people are intimidated by cooking buffalo. Um, but you don't, you know, it doesn't need to be like that. So, yeah. Oh, what I was saying is when I was up in Six Nations, um, gosh, it was a long time ago, <laughs> when I was like 19 or something. Um, but we had, we were at some, a ceremony and we had like a very similar um, dish to Wojabi. It was like a strawberry, maybe berry soup Is or it juice like though? We, oh, it's probably our juice. We serve strawberry juice. Oh, okay. It was so good. So like it everything. Reminded, it reminded <laughs> yeah. me of Wojabi. It was so good. Yeah, so yeah. Saying, I'm like, I know we do it like fresh like that, but um, <laughs> I just can't really think of anything like that where we kind of make like a jam, like because we have like in this area we're kind of, you know, colonized by the British, so you know to have scone and jam and things like that is really big. But I'm like, I don't know, I can't think of like you know pre-colonial stuff that would be, but because yeah, so many of them we like just dried them, ate them and stuff, I guess. But I'm sure we had it. I don't know how we couldn't have. I just can't think of anybody that. <laughs> so Let's ever show me about, about that. I have no idea why I'm like coughing all over the place. So I apologize. Just eat it. Okay. So this is a super, super. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Is that a just swallow a. a, a swallow a spoonful of that fat there it'll it'll coat your throat <laughs> i know i'm like what the heck i don't know what happened like the dryness or something just like <laughs> i apologize um so this is super easy Nor traditionally we actually do uh choke cherries i like blackberries the reason why i like blackberries is like they maintain some of their berryness inside the wojapi so it doesn't just turn into a total liquid and I just use, it's a really super simple recipe. I use one cup of berry, one cup of water, and one cup of sugar. You can use, if you're not using sugar, that's fine. You can use maple syrup, you can use agave, you can use honey. I wouldn't know the exact percentage ratio. Um, and then you're gonna bring, you're gonna bring it to a boil, and then you're gonna bring it down to simmer for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then um, you're gonna let it thicken. And this is a little thicker than our traditional Wojaki because I use it as like a glaze. And so I made this earlier. And what I did was like, so now it's like pretty thick. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's a great combination to go over this entire dish. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to do it in just a second. Yeah, so and we have people a, know if, if they make their wajapi, if it thickens up like that, just, you know, throw a tablespoon or water or so in there and mix it up. Yeah, and do your if you water, want to pre-bake it. Um, I would do it slow, you know. Um, I've had it both ways where, like, it's, like, a little too watery or it's a little too thick. And so just, if you need it to be thicker, just cook it a little longer. Um, and then if you want to make it waterier, just add a little more water into it. And so then you have your plate here. And I'm going to do the buffalo. Okay. 
And I kind of have become like where I use wojapi as like an everyday topper of things. Like I make these delicious buffalo, buffalo meatballs and they're so, so good. And I just put a little wojapi on it because I love the combination or mixture of the savory and sweet. Yeah, that's good with anything. I had a bunch of wild cherries. We did that, but I pretty much did that, made a wajabi and then made barbecue sauce and then put them together. So just, you know, oh. to make this awesome cherry barbecue that, that yeah. Oh my like, God, that's that so, so good. So then I just kind of put this on top. And then I have these like really beautiful micro cabbage, it's super pretty. So then I just put that on top. And what I love about these is like, they actually look like little hearts. And again, I have that like flowering rosemary. So they just put it, make it look, look pretty. Put a little couple of berries on there. And so this is how I would serve it to you. See how beautiful it is? To bring it closer. <laughs> and don't, but don't let it slide off the plate. <laughs> Oh, that is so pretty. And yeah, look at that Hasselbeck squash. It was great. Isn't that pretty? And so then it's like this really pretty clean the plate at first, but, um, and it like looks like a piece of art, but it's absolutely delicious. And this is how I would serve it if I was feeding you. Five star at home. <laughs> Wait, what did you say? I said five star at home. <laughs> But that's also like when you look at it. So that's a gluten-free meal. It's a dairy-free meal. There's uh, yeah, like barely hardly any sugar. If you think you have that whole thing and you only used a quarter cup at the end of the day, like it, it I, I like that indigenous foods are just so awesome for so many dietary restrictions. Like all these things that make us sick. I agree. We don't use those because we never had that, right? We never had right. dairy. We never had cheese. We never had gluten. We never had bread. We never had all of these things that are that. Um, as caterers that we get in terms of dietary restrictions, that's something I actually like when I'm working in indigenous foods. I'm like, none of this stuff touches any of that. So yeah. you probably notice that as well. I think we get a lot of catering jobs, especially like colleges and universities where they really want like um, just healthy food. And, and if I make a buffet, I want to make it to suit all of those people's needs because I don't want anybody to be up there and be like, what can I have? And right. you go to so many yeah. events where it's like they got their little granola bars in their pockets because they know they usually can't have anything. And, you know, and they're just like, what do you mean I can have everything? Right. It's, it's, it's so amazing. That's why I think something so awesome about Indigenous foods, about it being so I know, and I think too, like, um, anytime that you can get people to eat traditional foods that feels like an approachable way that they'll actually eat it and enjoy it, they're likely to do it again instead yeah. of like scary intimidating thing that feels like it it's no longer a part of us rather that it is a part of who we are and that you know it's delicious and it feels like when I eat this meal it feels like it nur nourishes nurtures me you know like my spirit and it makes mm -hmm. me feel stronger and like my kids love it you know today they were like what are you cooking for the cooking show and I told them they're like oh my god I'm so excited that's what we're having for dinner and you, you know, <laughs> The more that you make indigenous food approachable, like to the average person or family, <clears throat> the easier it is. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, sorry. Any other questions? I was just checking that out there. Um, someone just asked if you could do it in a Dutch oven the meat but yeah so yeah <laughs> definitely you can do dutch, dutch ovens just um crock pots are better for you because they're more energy efficient <laughs> i mean you could do it in the, you could do it in dutch oven but you would want to probably cut down on your time i would probably make it between five and six hours and you would drop your temperature way low um you know like maybe 220 degrees and again i wouldn't yeah. leave it. like i said like with the crock pot i would want to check it to make sure that it's not drying out um, so that's what I would do if, if I used a Dutch oven. Okay. Well, they did want me to mention also about the next series um, with Hello Echo Hawk. It's April 13th. And 
yeah, so if you liked what you've seen today, you get to see it again. She'll have another great menu for you. And we just wanted to mention that you can check that out April 13th. And I wanted to mention too that you can follow Etiquette and me on Instagram at Etiquette Catering Co. Um, or on Facebook at Etiquette Catering Co. And, um, you know, we're always posting different foods and charcuterie and classes and other things that we're doing. So I really appreciate your patience and your grace. I'm sorry I choked on TV or on the screen, but um, thank you. And yeah, you know, thanks, Tanya. It was so fun being with you. Yeah, I had a great time and it was actually the first time me and Kim actually really got to uh, well, sort of be face to face and actually talk to each other. Um, I've been following for, for a long, I can attest that like your Instagram, your like photos are gorgeous. That's what absolutely what attracted me to your page and, and uh, having to get to know you now a little more is so awesome because I know we did a lot of, a lot of parodies in our career there um, with the uh, with everything really, I guess. <laughs> like we both kind of grew up around our traditional foods and stuff, but then later in our careers decided to work with our traditional foods. So I think that's awesome. And it was fun to do this today. Um, I'm just looking at the, see if there's anything else you wanted me to do. Yeah, kind of, she wanted to ask as well, uh, could you suggest a drink to pair with this meal? I would do like a chayaka, a mint, a traditional a wild mint tea really easy to make. Um, you just steep the, the mint and then fill it. And if you want to add sweetener, you can, but honestly, it's so good. You don't really need to, but you can add honey to it um, or just like water with lemon or something like that. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a good meal. It's just something refreshing and light. You just go perfect with that. Yeah. And that's what's so um, good about this too, is like, even though it's like a big protein, like it doesn't sit in your stomach like other proteins do. Like it's very light and you're still going to be able to be like have energy and, you know, it really is uh, the protein that fuels your body. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I don't know how oh, well and you can also... I know Yeah, we, we do have time for more questions. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, okay. Yeah, but I, I wanna ask Kim, Kim, tell us a little bit of your story. How did you get into this and why is cooking traditional foods so important to you? What do you, what do you think, it, uh, why is it such a, such a critically important uh, thing in your life and for indigenous people? Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm Lakota and Jewish. I'm probably one of the few Jewish people you'll meet. And I was raised by my dad um, in Minnesota. Um, I was born on Pine Ridge, but raised my dad in Minnesota um, among my Jewish family. And I grew up with all brothers and my dad was an actual terrible cook. And so I learned to cook from a pretty young age from my aunts and my grandmother um, on my Jewish side. But then when I would come home for the summer to the res, I'd ask my mom and my mom would teach me how to make different foods and soups. And, um, and so I would learn how to, you know, make those for my brothers and my family when I was back home. And then I just really, I loved cooking. I always have, and I love learning um, about cultural connection and identity and how, when we learn about our cultural foods, how it, you know, fulfills us and sustains us. Um, and you know, I just started doing that. And then I met my husband um, 15 and a half years ago. And we he's Lakota and Northern Cheyenne. And we he, he's a hunter. And so he started teaching me a lot more about wild game and meats. And he started teaching me about things that his family has taught him um, about traditional foods. And, and then it slowly kind of evolved over time. And then um, when my dad was launching Tonka Bar, we did a lot of research on traditional wasna and our traditional foods and what are those foods that help you know maintain your body and your health um, so that you you know have some rejuvenation and you know can sustain yourself and so then um, that's kind of how it came to be and you know three years ago we were in a situation where my husband um, was under a health crisis and we needed something new and different and um, one of the things that we've done together as a married couple is cook together. And so I started Etiquette with him and he built out this beautiful space that we're in right now. And, you know, he's moved on actually um, to another position outside of Etiquette, but I'm still here holding it down and, you know, it's going great. 
I love that. I just love that about traditional foods and how they sustain us and just how we're not typecast into a cuisine, right? Every cuisine is set. What's, you know, what's French, what's Greek, what's, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, but if the indigenous cuisine is almost like it's brand new, right? And, and all of our journeys as chefs are so different. It makes all of our cuisines different. And I think that's something people are finding really exciting about indigenous foods. Um, there was one question about, um, <laughs> um, is there a place for using convection oven in cooking traditional foods? And I'm going to say yes, because I do it every day and I love my convection oven. And if I didn't have it, I, there's a lot of days I wouldn't know what I'd be doing in my restaurant. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same. I use mine pretty much every day as well. I love roasting, grilling, anything. The thing I find funny though, that are all the traditional breads that we bake. Um, we do like scone or Indian cookies, things like that. There's not, there's nothing that we make that you can actually make in a convection oven for, for our breads and stuff. <laughs> That's what I always find that funny, but everything else. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> okay. I'll just look and see if there was any, are there any cookbooks you could recommend? Um, definitely yeah, so. Sean Sherwin's cookbook. I absolutely love it. It's so great. And it has so many recipes um, and also history in there. So I think that would be a really good cookbook. Um, no, but I should write one. You should too, Tanya. <laughs> I've yeah, been asked a few times. I don't, I don't read cookbooks, so um, I don't really know what go into them. So I've been kind of like, like, I mean, I have them. I have everybody's cookbooks, but, uh, you know. I feel bad saying I haven't read them yet, but it's just, this is not something I do. And I, I don't do that because I feel like it, it, um, I don't want it to reflect my cuisine or, cha or change it or anything like that. Like, yeah. I kind of find that you're cooking, like, I guess you could say. So I, you're a tactile learner. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, I don't um, people are like oh can I get a recipe or make a cookbook I'm like I don't use recipes I'm a chef <laughs> but I'm getting better I'm getting on it I get started I guess I'll write things down <laughs> I, I'm trying I'm trying to like write things down get more specific about it but it is hard when you're like you cook through feeling you know like what feels right yeah Definitely. And some things you just can't have recipes for. Like you can give a recipe to make fry bread till the cows come home, but it's not going to be good. And it's, it's by feel, right? It's hundred percent by feel. So practice and makes perfect, realize, like, everybody. Especially with fry bread too. <laughs> like fry bread is like the, the um, temperature in your kitchen, like the, you know, everything matters. Like even the outside um, air pressure can affect your bread um, that I don't think people recognize. Yeah. Yeah, so this is one of those things our practice makes perfect and, you know, I think a lot of our foods are like that, though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Any other questions? Uh, are, the one says, where can I get more information on cooking with kids? For instance, healthy, simple recipes or techniques you might suggest. Um, you can check out our website too, etiquettecateringco.com. Um, often, every couple of weeks, my daughter, who is nine, Paloma and I, we do cooking classes and it's not just indigenous foods. We kind of do whatever she feels like cooking, um, but you can follow us on Facebook and stuff. Um, I have, I don't really know. I don't, I don't really follow other um, moms, but you, we, we try to post what we're actually eating for dinner. So um, you can follow us. Yeah, that's um, cooking for kids is always a challenge. I always said that that I, I took years off to have my boys where that's where kind of where the catering came in. But I was like, I never went back to restaurants yet, but I'm definitely culinarily challenged every day. <laughs> it's like, oh, I cooked all day. Yeah, I'm going to have a yogurt. <laughs> you know? That's so funny. I mean, I think, I think the other thing, too, is like, you know, for my kids, they because they've experienced so many different recipes and food from a such early age they're really like they have pretty sophisticated palates and I think that's an important thing to talk about too is like the more when the more you as a parent um teach them about their traditional foods and also teach them about different healthy foods they're more likely to want it even if they say no in the beginning they're gonna start craving it I mean 
I, we do charcuterie and our three-year-old literally asks for charcuterie every day. And she knows all kinds yeah. of different cheeses and meats. And she's like, my favorite is the spicy elk summer sausage. And, you know, so, and she's three. Um, so there's hope for everybody. Yeah, that's so cute. That's how, yeah, that's what I was saying to my, my hubby before. I was just like, oh, we basically just ate baby charcuterie every day. Because <laughs> I know it's something that they're going to eat. They like it. They're getting all the you know, all the right. categories you need of food that you have to eat doing exactly. that. So charcuteries exactly. are awesome for that. <laughs> yeah, totally. My figure is more traditional too, because we never really, for like Haudenosaunee, we never really had set meal, meal times, right? It was kind of an eat word when you're hungry type of society. And I just, I was like, uh, charcuterie kind of goes right in with that, right? We had kind of like, you know, pot of soup on all day. Uh, but yeah, just, I think charcuterie is very, very indigenous foods friendly. <laughs> I agree. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's how like most people want to eat. They're like a little bit of berries, a little bit of meat, a little bit, you know, yeah, totally. So can I jump in for a moment, Kim? Sure. You know, Jewish, Jewish food is very distinctive. It's a very yes. distinctive cuisine. Have you ever combined the two? Is there a way that oh, you yeah. used, you know, what, can you give us an example of how you might've combined sort of traditional Jewish food with indigenous uh, cuisine? Sure. Um, so for Passover, instead of like a traditional Jewish brisket, I actually do this roast, um, this buffalo roast. Um, I do do a traditional matzo ball um, soup still, um, but I do it with an all uh, chicken um, claw uh, bone broth. Um, and so it's like this really rich and thick um, flavor. And so I do that for Passover. Um, and so those are some of the ways that I've combined them, but I try to do both. Um, and I feel like my food tastes like both. <laughs> you know, like when somebody eats my buffalo, I'm like, they're like, this is my, my Jewish grandmother made this story. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, so um, I try to combine them as much as I can. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then one last question uh, I'll jump in and ask. And that is, do you have any suggestions for adjusting the recipes? for elders who have difficulty chewing or swallowing? Um, I would definitely, like with the Hasselback, I would overcook it so that it's really like um, mushy and that would be easy to consume. Um, the buffalo should be okay because it's so tender and so moist. Um, I actually cook quite often for our unhoused relatives here. And so the more tender and slow and low cooking that you do with protein, the easier they are to consume and chew because most of our unhoused relatives don't have teeth. Um, and so I try to do that, but I think the buffalo should be fine. Okay, great, thank you. So I'd like to thank both of you, Kim and Tanya, this was a wonderful, wonderful discussion, a great presentation. Everybody is commenting. They wish that they could be tasting it themselves. It's making them salivate. Everybody's getting hungry. So I think we'll let everybody go and get something to eat now, although it won't be as delicious, I'm sure, as what you presented. So thank you so much to our chefs, Kim, uh, Kim and Tanya. And I'd like to mention again that the next webinar is on April 13th with Hillel Echohawk, and there is a link in the chat that everybody can use to register. And also there is a survey that we're sending out for feedback afterwards because we'd love your feedback as well. So I would like to thank both of you and so much. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And also Tanya is gonna be doing a presentation in the next few months too. So keep your eyes open for that because uh, we will get an, have an opportunity to not just hear Tanya speaking, but also uh, see you cooking as well. And uh, so that is very exciting. So thank you both so much, Kim. Is there anything that you'd like to add or say to folks before we, before we end? Thank you all so much for watching and supporting us. We really appreciate it. Support your indigenous women chefs, you know, eat your indigenous foods and yeah, we appreciate you. Thank you both so much. It was just a wonderful, wonderful webinar. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.